What is the one thing most people have in common in the new year? It's not hangovers. It's new year resolutions, isn't it? Most of us make resolutions. I'm saying most of us because I'm sure some of us don't. One young boy asked his father what his New Year's resolution was. His father said he was going to do everything possible in the New Year to make his mother very happy. The boy asked his mother what hers was. She said, to do everything possible to make sure your father keeps his resolution. <laughs> Why do we make these resolutions anyway? We make them because our areas in our lives we are either unhappy with or areas in our lives we want to be better with or to change. We did a survey a, a few years back, I'm sure it would be very similar here, and the number one resolution in America was to lose weight. My wife came into the bathroom to see her husband standing in the scales, sucking in his stomach. She told him that that wouldn't make him any lighter. He said it would because if he didn't do that, he wouldn't see the numbers. <laughs> when he was 88, the Supreme Court Justice of the United States, Oliver Wendell Holmes, found himself on a train. The conductor called to collect the tickets. Justice Holmes couldn't find his ticket. He seemed terribly upset. He searched his pockets, fumbled through his wallet without success. The conductor was very sympathetic and said, don't worry Mr. Holmes, he said, the Pennsylvania Railroad will be happy to trust you. When you reach your destination, you'll probably find your ticket and you can mail it to us. The conductor's kindness didn't put Holmes at ease. He said, my dear man, my problem is not where is my ticket, but rather where am I going? Unfortunately, we are too often like that. We move forward through life unsure of how to respond to the changing situations in the world around us. The problem often is that we have no clear direction or picture of where we are going. We lack a defined destination. We lack vision. Let's read a few verses from Hebrews chapter 11. Very well known verses, I'm sure, to many of you. Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll start from verse 6. The writer has been talking about faith. And as he moves through, he starts to list people who showed faith in their lives. And he says this in verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, when Noah, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham, when called to get to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. I'm sure God will bless public reading of his work to our hearts and minds. The highest um, viewed drama over the New Year period was Sherlock Holmes. I don't know if you, you know. I haven't seen it yet, but it was similar highest one. And Sherlock Holmes and Watson were camping one night. 
in the middle of the night, Charlotte Holmes awoke and looked up at the stars and he, he, he said to Watson, Watson, what do you see? Woken from his sleep, Watson looked up and said, stars. He asked, well, what did these stars tell you? Watson said, well, cosmologically, they tell me that, that we are part of a large universe and that we are one of billions and billions of planets. Theologically, they tell me we have a great God who made all of it. Meteorologically, they tell me the sky is clear and we will have good weather tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tell, temporarily, they tell me that it's the middle of the night and we should be sleeping. Sherlock, what did they tell you? Well, said Sherlock, they tell me someone's stolen our tent. <laughs> Let me ask you this morning, what do you see as you think over the past year and look forward to the new year? What do you see? Where are we as a church going? Where are we as Christians going? In terms of vision, I want to put it that there are three different types of churches and people. There's the undertaking church. The undertaking church. You know them. The churches that are always looking back. Always looking back. People always talk about it, don't they? The good old days. The good old days. They miss what is happening today because they're always looking back to yesterday. Decisions in this kind of church are based on what has worked in the past. If it was good enough for them, it's good enough for us. Israel was a bit like that, weren't they? You remember? Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our hearts for, there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy and said, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? The children of Israel missed what God was doing. Because God was doing a new thing. But they didn't understand it. They saw the captivity as being an end. And not a beginning. They did not see that through the captivity God was setting the stage for Jesus. The Babylonians would be defeated by the Persians who would allow the Jews to spread all across the Mediterranean. They would be defeated by the Greeks who would unify all the peoples through its language and customs. They would be defeated by the Romans who would build roads and make transportation possible to every remote remote corner of the known world and so when Jesus was born the stage was set as the message spread like wildfire and in one generation would reach most of the known world. Many years ago Maxi Tung who was the leader of China started a great persecution of Christians Mao wanted to eliminate Christianity. First he arrested the Christians. Then he spread them all over the country thinking that they could not meet together so the churches would die. Second he wanted to punish them so he gave them the worst jobs possible. Rubbish collectors and grave diggers. On the surface you thought that, that could have worked. However, in spreading out the Christians, he planted Christianity through the entire nation. In making Christians rubbish collectors, he gave them access to every home in the country. And making them grave diggers, he placed them with, in situations where they could share their hope with people who were grieving.
when we look at our situation now and we look, oh, it was better in the past, it was better in the past, we miss what God is doing. Poor eyes limit our sight. Poor vision limits our deeds. Well, we can learn from the past. We can't live there. You have to live and adapt to where you are or you will perish. Always saddens me when I see these documentaries in maybe like the south of Spain where you find these expat communities of these people who act and live as though they still lived in Britain. It just, it just doesn't work. They're hanging on to a lifestyle that's not there. And as Christians, we have to adapt in order, in order to live out our life in front of others. Too many churches today, too many Christians today are spending their time and resources lamenting the past when they should be adapting to the future. What has worked in the past may not work in the present because the audience has changed. I know, I was brought up in, you know, well, can just, just remember, I say I remember, I can't remember because I was just a baby, the Billy Graham Crusades, certainly the Louis Palau Crusades. I can remember all these things. And it was wonderful seeing hundreds walking forward to commit their lives to the Lord. But that doesn't mean that will work today. Because of social media and all different things, big rallies are, are, are not necessarily the way ahead. One writer put it this, like this, the gospel must be preached afresh and told in new ways to every generation. He's not saying change the gospel, he's saying it just must be preached afresh and told in new ways to every generation, since every generation has its own unique questions. The gospel must constantly be forwarded to a new address because the recipient is repeatedly changing their place of residence. And so while it's possible for a church always to be looking back, it's possible for us as people always to look back. How do you look at your walk with Jesus? Do you remember the glory days? When you were younger and you were on fire for the Lord? Maybe when you were a student? Or do you feel that the best years of your work for the Lord are still to come? When they rebuilt the temple after the captivity, many people were upset because it wasn't as beautiful as it was before. Haggai Chapter 2, who of you is left to saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem like nothing? But God reminded his people that he was still there. And his spirit was there. It's impossible to serve God yesterday. You cannot live off yesterday's bread. It doesn't matter how God has used you or me in the past. How he will use you. In the future is what is important. A person or church that tries to walk looking backwards, and I'll dare you to try it, walk looking backwards, what happens? You fall, don't you? The backward looking church. Then there's a caretaking church, the present. We live in a world in which it's hard to have a vision, to have vision. People expect everything to make sense logically. And vision very rarely fits into people's equations. Sometimes the church loses its vision and trust in God. It's easy to feel this way when times get tough and, and things are not going the way we planned. It's easy to get that way today. We need to be a church of faith. Which completely and totally trusts God for everything. Sometimes it's hard to have faith when, we, when it doesn't make sense, when all logic says something can't be done. But with God, it can. 
the caretaking church is always concerned with pressing issues. It's so busy and so many needs to focus on. It always seems to be in maintenance mode. Just trying to keep its head above water. Number one question in a caretaking church. Do I have enough money to do this? I won't go any further on that one. Jesus called his disciples to him in Matthew 15 and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry or they may collapse in the way. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? A caretaking church is realistic and comfortable. As long as the services are good, as long as our needs as a congregation are being met, as long as people are happy, then all is well. If it isn't broken, then don't fix it. Problem is, the caretaking church is walking by sight, not by faith. And it's easy to slip into caretaking mode in our Christian walk. And I'm sure we've experienced this in our own lives. When in your work you're you're so concerned with what is happening there. It's so great a problem that you cannot see tomorrow coming and you, and you don't know what's ahead. But we need to have a greater vision as individuals of God's plan and purpose in our lives. Are our thoughts on today? Or can we still see the big picture? Charles Swindle says, vision encompasses vast vistas outside the realm of the predictable, the safe, and the expected. Theodore Roosevelt said, no person is worth his salt who is not ready at all times to risk his well-being, his body, to risk his life in a great cause. The caretaking church. The caretaking Christian. I want to just finish up with the risk taking church. The risk taking church. The risk taking church is always looking forward. They believe the best is yet to come. They invest all they have today so that it can be all that God wants them to be tomorrow. Risk-taking churches seek to be maybe cutting edge. They want to see how God is moving to make use of all available resources to make Christ known. And of course one of the reasons we don't take risks is fear of failure. But failure is just part of life and often a prerequisite to success. If you aren't failing, you aren't trying. Once heard George Verwer of OM speak about how that organisation came to be. It was birthed out of failure. One book puts it, failure is a back door to success. If we want to see a church move forward with vision, we must accept the fact that there will be times in the future that we may fail. Jonas Salk, you've probably never heard of him, attempted 200 unsuccessful vaccines for polio before he came up with the one that worked. Somebody asked him one time, how did it feel to fail 200 times trying to invent a vaccine for polio? His response was, I never failed 200 times at anything in my life. My family taught me never to use that word. I simply discovered 200 ways how not to make a vaccine for polio. <laughs> It will be part of taking that risk. Failure will be part of that. And we have to accept it. A blind man's world is bounded by the limits of his touch. 
An ignorant man's world is bounded by the limits of his knowledge. A great man's world is bounded by the limits of his vision. That is God. By faith Noah, we read, went and built an ark. Think about this. He invested everything. in something that seemed completely impossible. Can you imagine building a boat in your backyard that is so big that it can't be moved? People could not see or understand it. He based his life on God's word and was willing to wait 120 years for the promise to be fulfilled. Noah's vision was based on what he had been told by God. By faith, Abraham left his home and went to the promised land. Though he was living in a tent, he saw the future city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He believed God and he based his life on that vision. What destroys our perspective? is our tendency to measure ministry on too small a scale. We lose the wide-angle view. We are riveted on the close-up. We use the microscopic lens. You know when you look through a microscope at a spider? I don't know if you have. It's a hairy, horrible monster. And most of us would never touch a cobweb in the house if we saw what a spider looked like closer. God has always provided for his people. In the desert he provided manna as the Israelites wandered. He always provides for the faithful. I'm sure many of us can tell time and time again of how God has provided for us. He meets our needs. We need to have faith during the times of trial and the hard times that we will go through. But we have that faith because God is good. He has never failed us. He knows what is going on in our lives. He knows our needs. He has the hairs on our head numbered. For some of us that's more difficult than others, I'm sure. But he has the hairs on our head numbered. And we can rest assured he will take care of us, even if it's not how we expect or what we expect. The thing is, he provides. Jesus was a risk, a risk taker. He entrusted the salvation of the world to a living, weak and frightened man. Through God's power and vision, they changed the world. And instead of looking at past or trusting the present, they saw God's church and they boldly went forward to make it happen. Where is our vision today? How big is our faith? In which direction are we looking? Are we looking at God? To see how great, how majestic, how wonderful he is? Are we willing to lay everything on the line for God? <coughs> Are you motivated by what, by what has happened in your life? Or by what you presently have? Or are you open for God to use you in ways that you have never been used before? Is your vision for your life and family limited to immediate needs? God is shaking the kingdoms of the earth and the kingdom of heaven is advancing. Let's not miss what God is doing. Let's join him. A vision without a task is a dream. A task without a vision is drudgery. A vision and a task is the hope of the world, said one writer. 
eight-year-old Frank had looked forward for weeks to this particular Saturday because his father had promised to take him fishing. There hadn't been any rain for weeks. Obviously not in England, but there hadn't been any rain for weeks. And as Saturday approached, Frank was confident of a fishing trip. But wouldn't you know it, when Saturday morning dawned, it was raining heavily. And it appeared it would continue all day. Frank wandered round the house, peering out the windows, grumbling. Seems like the Lord would know it. It would have been better to have rained yesterday and today. He complained to his father, who was sitting by the fireplace. His father tried to explain to Frank how badly the rain was needed, how it would make the flowers grow and uh, bring moisture to the crops, but Frank was adamant. It just isn't right, he said over and over. Then about three o'clock the rain stopped. Still time for some fishing, quickly the gear was loaded and they were off to the lake. <coughs> Now whether it was the rain or some other reason, the fish were biting hungrily. The father and his son returned with a full basket of fish. At supper, when some of the fish were ready, Frank's mum asked him to say grace. Frank did and concluded his prayer by saying, Lord, if I sounded grumpier earlier today, it's because I couldn't see far enough ahead. No doubt much of our complaining. No doubt much of our worrying. No doubt much of our concern. No doubt much of our wondering what the day will bring forth is because we can't see far enough ahead. And as we look into the coming year, what do we see? A lot of times we don't know who we are in Christ. A lot of times we haven't grasped the promises that God has given us, the blessings that he has promised to his children. <clears throat> we act like who we were instead of acting like who we are. We don't do things that we can do because we can't do them. After all, we think we could never do them in the past. We believe the lie of the devil rather than the word of God. We need to see from the word of God who we really are. We need to believe the word of God and act on that belief. And we will find that when we take that step of faith, we can do what he said we could do. Because it's true. With the call of God comes the power of God to obey God. God never calls you to do something that he will not give you the power to do. Why would we do that? He knows you can't do it in your own strength. When he called Peter out of the boat, the power to walk in water was given to Peter. When did Peter realise that he had the power? When he was in the boat? No. I hesitate to see it. You'll never know if you can walk in water until you get out of the boat. I'm sure there's things that God wants you to do. And you're saying, I can't do them. I can't do them. You'll never know until you trust in God and move forward and rely on him. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you are a great God. A God who can do above all that we could ask or think. And Father, we confess that so often we limit you. We limit you by our fear. We limit you by our lack of vision. We limit you by looking back to the past and what has happened there. We limit you by the things that are pressing us here in the present. 
Father, help us to look at you. Help us to realise how great you are. Help us to realise how wonderful you are. Help us to realise the power that is at your command. And Father, help us to move forward relying on you and trusting you. That we might achieve not in our own strength, but that we might achieve mighty things for you. That you might have the honour and glory and the Lord Jesus Christ might be lifted up and people drawn to him. So Father, we pray, help us <coughs> to walk forward with you, to try new things if that is the way you want us to go. But always to trust you, to rely on you, because you are our God. Amen. I'm going to sing.